Ready for the word? Yes. Amen. Uh, well, it's my privilege to introduce to you Pastor Gil. How many of you know Pastor Gil? He's been here many times. Those of you, yep, give him a good, yeah, let's give a bigger welcome than that. Come on, hey. <laughs> Pastor Gil is like a dad to me. He's so old. No, I'm just, yeah, I'm just teasing. No, I'm, I'm the old looking one. He's the young looking one. I tell you, I went to a pastor's conference yesterday, and uh, all these pastors are dyeing their hair. I, I tell you, I felt like the oldest guy there, even though they're older than me. So I'm thinking a jet black. You think it'd be good? So I'm going to do the Elvis thing. No, I'm kidding. But uh, Pastor Gill does not dye his hair. It's good. But uh, he's a good friend of mine. I've known him for just, what, 28, 29 years. And he has been in this community for 36, 35? What is it? No, I mean, but pastor. 36 years. How many of that's awesome? And that's awesome because they say the average pastor today stays in his church only about two years. I mean, that's awesome, okay? I'm just a wimp. I've only been here for 14 years, but uh, 16 years. Well, I've been in this town longer than a pastor, but senior pastor. So, uh, I just want you to give, uh, give your hearts to listen to what God has to say through Pastor Gill and give him a great warm welcome again. Bless you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm using this because uh, I brought my iPad, but I, we couldn't connect the, I call it Wi-Fi. So <laughs> we're driving down the road in uh, Pierce, Pierce, Arizona, and uh, I asked my wife, I said, what's free Wi-Fi? She started laughing. She says, you Mexican, she says, free Wi-Fi. <laughs> so my wife and I, we joke around with each other. How many uh, uh, have been here for a while? Amen. Pretty, pretty neat church. I really, every time I pass by here, I pray for you guys and just say, Lord, just continue to pour out your blessings upon uh, Calvary and Pastor Craig and his amazing family and it's just so good to, to see you guys. Um, you know, it's, it's something uh, we've been uh, trying to uh, teach a series this year. Normally we go through, I like to go through a couple of books in the Word every year um, if we can. Sometimes I know we went through a, a book of Hebrews and uh, took us a couple of years. And, but... Uh, I like to just, uh, I, I love verse by verse teaching. I love to hear Pastor Chuck on the, on the air. Though he's in heaven, he's still preaching. And uh, I, I just love that type of ministry. But uh, there are times though when I go through a series and I was asking the Lord last year, usually to, towards the end of the year, I, I say, Lord, what do you have in store for this coming year? Of course, this is an election year. I will not make any political statements, but uh, we need to pray. Uh, what a what a what a crazy election this is. Anyway, we need to really pray. Uh, but uh, I, I just go, at the end of the year, I go through a, a time of just seeking the Lord. Say, Lord, what do you have in store for the coming year? What's what's your plan? You know, what do you have for me? What do you have for our community, our nation, and what's going on in the spirit, so that I can communicate uh, something to your people. And last year as we were, as I was seeking the Lord and uh, praying, I felt the Lord tell, speak to me and uh, say, talk about fresh fire. What, what does it mean to have a, a fresh uh, experience with Jesus and with the Spirit? And uh, so that's what we've been doing this year. We still can't get out of the subject of, of fresh fire. It's a uh, really a, a study and a concept of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, the Word says that in the last days, God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. How many believe that's a good thing? Amen. If the whole planet uh, would be touched by God, I think that'd be a good thing. It, just if our city was, was touched by God, it'd be good. Uh, if our nation was touched by God, it, it completely changed things. And, and God makes all the difference. You know, I, I've... I've been walking with the Lord for a long time, and uh, I've seen the Lord change people's lives. I mean, they, I see when people just come out of prison or just get saved out of alcohol abuse or, or you know, maybe they had a terrible childhood, and, you know, I see people come to, to Jesus, and, and just to see that transformation, isn't it a beautiful thing to see God transform somebody's life? 
You know, you see young people. I was born again during the Jesus movement. You know, being from Southern California, um, you live close to the ocean, just about 15 minutes away, and uh, my buddies and I would love to just ditch the last period, and we had an open campus, and we'd get in his Mustang and drive to the beach and just hang out. And I, I just remember when God started pouring out his spirit, I started seeing all these young people, uh, hippies and drug abusers and you name it, they started getting saved. And, and that's when I became a believer, but it was so exciting to see God transform lives and, and young people that were going uh, completely in a different direction. God turned their lives around and now they were radically saved and preaching the gospel and leading all kinds of people to Jesus. And, you know, that's how your movement started. It was out of that. And, you know, I've always talked about that when I come here because I, I, I went to Calvary when it first started, when they were in a tiny little church and, uh, and then they moved to this huge property, but it was just a tent. They didn't build their building yet. It was a big tent. And uh, I, I would just, I love to just be there and see God moving with the young people. I was young myself once. And <laughs> it was so, so cool to be in that far out move of God. And it was amazing to see the miracles and the lives that were changed. And so I've been asking the Lord, and I know Craig and I have been praying together for almost 10 years now, huh? We, we meet once a month with other pastors in town, and, but it was really your pastor's idea. And, uh, and we've been praying for God to move and God to pour out His Spirit again, and, and that's, that's our desire. So uh, I wanted to share with you on glory in the house. You know, what happens when, when God's presence comes uh, to, to a people, to an individual, uh, to, to a congregation, to a community, to a nation. Uh, and and the, like I started sharing with you guys that the word clearly states that, that in the last days. Now, how many believe we're in the last days? <laughs> you know, I mean, you look at our world. Uh, I mean, you look at gay marriage. You look at, uh, you know, what's going on in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, you look at terrorism and uh, what's going on in, in Iran, and uh, uh, I believe in Israel, I believe that we are living, you know, at the end. I'm not saying that Jesus is going to come in my lifetime, but he might come in some of you young people's lifetime, maybe in your lifetime. Yeah. But he is, you know, he's a lot younger than me. I, I know, he said I'm like his dad, but we're really, you know, a lot old, I'm a lot older. Uh, but uh, anyway, but, you know, we look at our world. I believe we are living in the last days. I've, I came to the conclusion several years ago, just studying the scriptures, that, you know, before Jesus returns, there's going to be a great harvest. There's going to be a, a, a great outpouring. And the result of an outpouring of God's love and spirit is, is a great harvest of people. Uh, you know, people from every walk of life, from every nation. If the word says that this gospel of the kingdom will be, will be preached to every nation as a witness, that means every nation. That means every people group. Uh, I used to get a missions magazine from Fuller Seminary. My brother was a pastor and he, he graduated from Fuller. And so I would get this newsletter from their missions department. And uh, back uh, when we first started in ministry 30 some years ago, I think the number was, there was around 11,000 several hundred unreached people groups. Uh, today, you know what that figure has gotten down to? It's like down to 1,100. From 11,000 just 30 years ago to 1,100. And that was an, an old magazine, so it's probably, I know it's less than that. Groups like Wycliffe, uh, different translating ministries are translating or, you know, the Bible into languages of different people groups around the world. So the gospel is being preached to every witness, to every nation, excuse me, as a witness. And then Jesus says, then the end will come. So uh, if that is the case, we are living in, in the last days, but we're also living in exciting times. You know, we could say, oh, how terrible, you know, what's going on in our in our world, what's going on in our country, what's going on in this, this election. Man, I'll tell you, this election is, I never thought I'd, I'd see an election like this one, but it's, it's crazy, amen? 
And so that alone tells me that Jesus has got to be coming too, especially if somebody gets in the White House. I mean, I believe Jesus is going to come. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, okay? So, uh, but uh, I, I asked the question, what, what is in the house? You know, what, you know, when it says the glory in, in the house, and uh, I just gave a few answers. Number one, the, the glory is in the church. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church and the powers of hell will not be able to stop it. You know, gates are not an offensive weapon. They're a defensive, uh, you know, uh, force. I mean, it's, it, I mean, they're powerful, you know. And we know that in, in the ancient days, the, the leaders, the judges hung out at the gates of a city. And so when Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail, he was talking, I believe, two things. Number one, he was talking about the powers of, of darkness, the leaders, uh, the principalities, and the powers of hell would not be able to. So that means that the big demons, the big fallen angels uh, will not be able to stop you. Uh, they will not be able to stop the, the church of Jesus Christ. It also, I believe, means that, that the, the gates of hell is a defense against the offense of the church. So we should never take a, a, a defensive posture as believers. We should always be on the offensive. How many have been watching the Olympics? Uh, pretty cool stuff, huh? Uh, we have some amazing young people. Uh, I've heard a couple of them just give glory to Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the synchronized divers, uh, you know, one young man says, my identity is not in this, but it's in Jesus Christ. And then his, his buddy, who looked kind of, he looked like, kind of like maybe he'd be a little bit shy, he took it a step further, and he really started preaching. It was really cool. Uh, but, you know, that one uh, African-American uh, swimmer that gave glory to the Lord. And it's just so beautiful, these young people. And, but all of them, they're so, they're so honored to be able to represent us as a nation. And, and that just, I mean, if, if that's what America is, there's hope. You know, these young people, amen? amen? Amazing young people, beautiful young people, talented, uh, dedicated. I mean, you tell me, I mean, these athletes are dedicated. If you've ever played sports, if you've ever done anything athletically, uh, it takes dedication. Uh, it takes commitment. Uh, it takes discipline. It takes denying yourself. Uh, you, you know, you do, I was a long distance runner and, uh, you know, it, it took a lot of dedication. We, we'd run, you know, five, ten miles a day. And we did that, you know, for several years. And, and so I know what it, a little bit of what it takes to, to do that. And so these athletes take tremendous uh, time and energy and, and put their lives really on, on hold uh, to, to dedicate themselves to their sport. And, and, and of course, now they're, they're on, on national television or worldwide television, which is pretty cool. So the, the glory is in the church, and, and so we should never take a, a, a defensive posture as believers. We should always be on, on the offensive. We should always be assaulting, not people, but the gates of hell, the powers of darkness, destroying strongholds, uh, com coming in, into agreement with other believers, other pastors, and doing warfare in, in the spirit realm, and and, and, and bringing in the kingdom. Our job is to bring in the kingdom every day. We should pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every day, you and I, when we get up in the morning, we, you know, you young people, before you go to school, pray that prayer. You know, let your kingdom, you know, invade my school today through me. Use me. Uh, I was uh, re remembering when I was in school, I, I would say, Lord, give me an opportunity to share uh, my faith in you with some of my uh, fellow uh, teammates or classmates. And, uh, and so that's our job. And, and so every time you share Jesus with somebody, you're on the offensive. Every time you live your life in such a way that other people wonder, why are you different? You know, you're taking an, an offensive posture. You're not waiting for the enemy to attack you. You're attacking him. Amen. You're, you're going into the marketplace if you're in business, if you're in whatever career you work in. My, my daughter is a social worker. She works for the VA. And uh, I always tell her, I said, her name is Noni. I said, Noni, remember, you're representing Jesus Christ. 
And, and every day when you go to work, you know, remember that's who you are. You're a, you're a light there in that place. God has put you there. She got employee of the month. I'm so proud of my daughter. And there's a you know, thousands of people that work there at the VA, if you've ever been there. And uh, I've, I've been there a few times, and uh, there's a lot of activity there. And, uh, and I always tell her, you be the light there. You shine your, your bright light. You know, you do your job with the spirit of excellence. And she does, and she always amazes me. Uh, so the glory is in the church. Now, who is the church? You know, it's, it's, this building is beautiful, but this is not the church. You know, it's who's in the building that makes the church. You're the church. And so that means that uh, the presence of God is in us. It's, yes, it's here corporately. But the reason it's here corporately is because it's in us individually. Amen? Amen. And that's where the glory of God is. And the glory of God is, is, is in you. It's in me. Uh, it's, in, it's in people who have been saved and been washed in Jesus' blood. And then bring it down a step more. The body, you know, our body is the temple or our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's where God's presence dwells. In the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit was in the tabernacle under Moses. It was in the tabernacle of David. It was in the temple that Solomon built. Uh, it was even, and we're going to look at where it was even before that. But in the New Covenant, it's in the individual believers. It's in you and me. His presence is in us. And every time we, we smile at somebody at the store, or we, we're courteous to someone, or we, we help somebody out. I was driving to church this uh, morning, and not to toot my own horn, but I was on the way and, you know, kind of going a little bit fast and coming down the hill and... And I see a young man walking, and he's, he's dressed in a suit. And I said, he's got to be going to church. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be. So I, I pulled over. I said, are you going to church? He goes, yeah, he's, it's a neighbor church right up the street from ours. So the Lord, because the Lord says, you know, give him a ride. So I gave him a ride to church because, you know, we're in a suit. You're walking. He took the bus, and he's going to get all sweaty by the time. Maybe he has a girlfriend at church, and he was dressed very nice. And so I gave him a ride. I put myself in his shoes. I gave him a ride, and we talked a little bit. And, Beautiful uh, uh, young people that I see every day that are, are, are really trying to serve God, really doing, doing their best to serve the Lord. And, and our job is to encourage them, amen? amen. It, just giving them a ride, uh, you know, giving them a word of encouragement, you know, uh, uh, just uh, letting them know maybe the Lord will tell you, give them 20 bucks. You know, I know that students always need cash. And so that's what you guys, you guys in the church should do with all the young people around here. You know, give them a 20, you know. Or, or a 10 or a 100 or whatever. whatever. Amen, young people? <laughs> but we need to encourage our young people. Amen? We need to really uh, just always pray for them. And every time we get a chance, tell them, you know, hey, I love the way you play the guitar. You know, I love the way you lead worship. You know, you play the drums really good. Or, you know, young people need to hear that. You see these young little children. You know, tell the little girls how beautiful they look. And the little boys, you know, how handsome they are, how smart they are. Amen? That's, that's what we're, we're to do. We're to encourage. And so the, the body is a temple of the Spirit. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So uh, I want to read you Romans. This is a scripture I've kind of camped out in. I love the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. We went through a study in the book of Romans uh, about you know, 25 years ago. It took us a long time. It's a powerful, powerful book. Uh, it's one of the most um, theologically... Uh, in-depth uh, books in the whole New Testament. And Paul wrote it. Paul wrote 13. If you believe he wrote Hebrews, which I believe he wrote Hebrews, there's 14 books that he, that he wrote. But in verse 19 it says, Everything God made is waiting with excitement for God to show His children's glory completely. You know, that, that's the, I think it's the New Century Version. The, the King James says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. But I like this translation. That everything God made, so all of creation with excitement is waiting for God to show His children's glory completely. That means that we are the carriers of that glory. You know, you are the one that carries 
If you're my age or if you're 10 years old and you know Jesus, you carry that presence wherever you go. And so here the word says that all of creation, just think about that. I'm looking outside, I can see the palm trees and the ski trees, ocotillos and all the beautiful, you know, creation. It's waiting for you and I to show our glory. You know, you have glory. That's not being cocky or it, have you noticed something about these athletes is that they're confident you know not arrogant you know but they're confident you know uh you know i know when phelps jumps in the water dives in the water he's thinking nothing but gold amen amen and that's the way we should be you know every day say i'm gonna win someone today you know i'm gonna win today for jesus you know, if you do good on the job, you're winning for Jesus. If you do good in your family, you're winning, you know, for them and for the Lord. And so here the word says that, that everything God made is waiting with excitement for God to show. God wants to show creation His glory that's in us. And I don't know if you, you know, if you're a, a person that likes to think about these things, you know, that's a pretty deep concept, isn't it? Don't you think that's deep? Like we used to say when I was a kid, that's heavy, man. <laughs> Amen? It is. It's deep. It's, it's a deep thought to think that all of creation is waiting for God to show His glory that's reflected in us. And, you know, if you look at Adam, when Adam was created, he, it says he was created in the image of God. God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And he takes dirt and he makes man and man is made in his image. So I believe that, that Adam, before he fell, literally was covered in the glory of God. If you looked at the Garden of Eden before Adam fell, you'd see two lights walking in the garden. God and Adam, because Adam was made in his likeness. So we're made in that likeness. Of course, we know that when Adam sinned, he lost the glory. That's when he recognized that he needed clothing, because before he was perfectly holy. So that means that he was perfectly, you know, pure and he was clothed in God's glory. So after he falls, the glory is removed. And that's why, and notice that Adam was created to live how long? How long was, was Adam or the original man created to live? Forever. And we, if we know Jesus, we, we know the second Adam, we get to live forever. Amen? Amen. So... Jesus came to restore us back to that original creation of a person, a man or a woman, being full of God's glory. And that's what creation is waiting for us to do, to reveal His glory to the world, to the, to the people in darkness, to the hurting. How many know somebody who's hurting? You know, maybe you work with them, maybe you go to school with them, maybe you're, they're your neighbor, but there's hurting people all around us. And as we walk in that presence, you know, that glory can be a tremendous force of healing and restoration and deliverance and salvation for the people all around us that are in pain, that are lonely, that are depressed, that are oppressed, even possessed. And if they see the glory in us, they can be set free. They can be delivered. They can be saved. And so Paul understood this concept. In uh, 1 Corinthians 6.19, the word says, Avoid sexual looseness like the plague. Every other sin that a man commits is done outside his own body. But this is an offense against his own body. Have you forgotten that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and that you are not the owner of your own body? You have been bought and at what a price. Therefore, bring glory to God both in your body and in your spirit, for they both belong to Him. 
you know, we know that Corinth was the San Francisco of the Roman Empire. I mean, I love San Francisco. My brother used to, my, my, several, my two older brothers lived in, in, in San Francisco. And, and when I was a kid growing up, we used to spend most of our summers in the Bay Area. Uh, going to watch the Giants play and, you know, just having fun. Uh, and uh, San Francisco is one of the most beautiful cities. The Golden Gate, you know, the, the, the bridges, the, you know, it's a beautiful place. But it's, it's also a place of perversity. And, uh, and so Corinth was that to the Roman Empire. And yet Paul, look what Paul tells them. He says, avoid sexual looseness. That, you know, this is like a plague. That was one of the problems of Corinth. There was a lot of immorality. And, and, and Paul tells these Corinthians because he said, some of you were in those lifestyles. He says that, amen? You, but God has delivered you. You're no longer there. But avoid going back into what God brought you out of. And so he tells them, he gives them the teaching that, you know, have you not forgotten that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Our bodies are the temple of God's glory. And that's why God wants us to be pure. That's why God wants us to be sexually pure, mentally pure, because really this is where it all starts. It starts in our mind. Amen? Amen. It, it starts, that's why the, the porn industry is so, uh, so dangerous. And, and that's why it makes so many, that's why it makes so much money. Uh, because it appeals to that base, you know, lower nature. But as believers, God has called us to live above all of that and to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, Rome, Romans tells us. You know, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable act of worship. You know, that's one thing that we are to do as we present ourselves to God as a holy sacrifice. That's the reason we do that is so that His glory can be seen as because our body is a temple of the glory of God. Our body is a temple of God's Spirit. And so I, I love that teaching. So uh, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Make no mistake, you are God's holy building. Don't you realize that you yourselves are the temple of God and God's Spirit lives in you? God will destroy anyone who defiles His temple, for His temple is holy his temple is holy, and that, exact, that is exactly what you are. Notice what Paul calls us. He calls us holy. The word calls us saints, amen? amen? You know, the Catholic Church canonizes people. Saint Teresa, Saint, you know, uh, whoever, and, you know, these individuals, and, and they say they, they are a saint, you know, and, and they, give, they have all this criteria that declares them to be a saint. And so the Pope and the Catholic uh, Church says that this person was a saint. Well, we're all saints. Every single one of us who knows Jesus, we're, the Bible calls us saints. Because we're full of His glory. Our body is the temple of His presence. And so he says, don't you realize that you yourselves are, are the temple of God and God's Spirit lives in you. So God's Spirit lives in the church, in the individual members of the church. And corporately He lives, we know He lives in us corporately, but He lives in us individually. And that's what we're here to do, to shine that glory in the darkness. Again, look at the revelation that Paul had. We are God's holy building. We are living in a culture that is so defiled. I was watching the late night you know, program after the Olympics the other night, and <laughs> is it Bob Costas? You know, he had a, a, two young people, and one guy, I looked at him, I go, well, what is he, you know? He, he's, a, he's a guy, but he's got a girl's hairdo on, and then he's got a dress, but he's a guy. And I said, wow, <laughs> Lord, I don't get it, you know? I mean, and you know, we're living at, in, in such a time where, you know, and of course, what does our culture say? You know, that's transgender. You know, they can use whatever restroom they want. You know, and uh, it's, I mean, it's, you know, we live in a sick culture. Amen? Amen. We live in a sick world. And I said, what does that young man have to do with the Olympics? Amen? Amen. I, I mean, he, you know, he's just a guy dressed like a girl. You know, and, you know, and it was a guy. You know, but he's dressed like a woman. You know, why is it that men want to be women and women want to be men? I don't get that. But that's the culture that we're living in. And that's the, the time that we're living in. And, and, 
And Paul, you know, they had some similar problems in the Roman Empire. There was some real perversity in the Roman Empire. If you study history, just look at some of the things that they would do and some of the practices that they had. It was perverse the way it is now. And so in the midst of all this perversity and weirdness and confusion, gender identity, I mean, what, you know, what is it? Or who is it? Or what are you? Or who are you? you know? I mean, we can have a people that know who they are. That you're a woman of God. That you're a man of God. And so if you're a woman of God, don't try and be a man. Be proud in who God has made you. If you're a man of God, don't try and be a woman. Be a man that God has made you. Amen? And that's holiness. And so that's why we set the standard. That's why Jesus said, you're the, the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world and you're the salt of the earth. We know that salt was used as a preservative. And light has always been as an illumination. Amen? Amen. It, it illuminates. It pushes back the darkness. But salt preserves what's good. And that's what we are to do. You know, we are to preserve what's good in humanity. Amen? Amen. That's our job. That's how, we re, re, that's how we reflect the glory of the Lord. And so, uh, I, I, you, you guys are studying 1 John? Uh, yeah, Wednesday yeah, Wednesday, okay. I love 1 John. The second chapter, I was just, as a matter of fact, when, you guys, uh, when Kevin announced it, I just started reading it on my iPhone that, you know, I love the second chapter. You know, God says in His Word, that in, in, in 1 John, He says, God is absolute light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. Has anybody ever thought of the concept of absolute light, what that must be like? If we were to stand in the presence of absolute light, we would disintegrate. We could not stand the force, the energy, the power of being in the presence of absolute light. Yet, that's what God is. That's what's in us. That's who's in us. The Almighty, you know, the, that light that is absolute in power, in force, in energy. Are you getting this? Yeah. It's heavy, huh? <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Every single believer in the world that knows the Lord, that's our job, to shine that light. And every time we, we, we wake up in the morning, every time we go to work, every time you go to the store, every time you, you do whatever you do in this life, you are the light of God and you're pushing back the darkness. Amen. And you're preserving whatever is good in that situation, in your life, in your family, in your job, in your school. Amen? Amen. I love this, this concept. So... Uh, there are examples, I'll, co I'll conclude pretty soon. Uh, there are examples of the presence of God. Three examples in the Old Testament. First, in Genesis 28, remember when Jacob met with God on the side of the mountain and he named that place Bethel, which means the house of God? There was no building there, but God was there, and that's what made it holy. That, that's the first example of God's presence in the Old Testament, as far as where he actually declared, my presence is here. That's why he named it Bethel. The second place was in the tabernacle of Moses. Every piece of furniture is a picture of the coming Messiah. The tabernacle, when they dedicated it, was full of the glory of God, for the presence of God always demonstrates or reveals the glory of God. So we find that on a mountain or a side of a mountain with Jacob. We find it in the tabernacle, which was a, a, an actual tent or a, a dwelling where God's presence was there. And then in the temple of Solomon. Solomon's temple was so lovely that it was one of the ancient seven wonders of the world. How many have ever studied the, the temple of Solomon? How much it costs? Approximately how much it costs? Some economists say that it costs not Millions, not hundreds of millions, but billions with a B. That's a lot of money for a church, amen? I mean, it was nice. My, I have a seven-year-old nephew. And uh, when we see, see something real nice, I'll say, nice, and he'll go, sweet. <laughs> it was sweet. <laughs> I mean, it had gold-plated walls. Some of the furniture was solid gold. 
I mean, it had imported marble, imported cedar. I mean, it was built of the finest material and it, it cost billions. To, David alone gave over $190 million to construct it. Pretty awesome place, I bet. Amen? Amen? And it was for God's glory. When they dedicated the temple of Solomon, what happened? The glory of God came in and they could not minister because the presence of God was so thick. That's what I pray will happen in the church before Jesus comes. Amen. That the presence of God will be so heavy in the church that all we'll do is be able to just go to church and sit in His presence. And let me tell you, when you actually are in the presence of God, it's transforming. I mean, you don't have to hear a sermon when God's glory is there. You will receive what God wants you to receive. And I believe that when the when the children of Israel dedicated these buildings to the tabernacle, the temple, and the glory of God came, it was a picture of the church. It was a picture of us. God was looking into the future, and He was seeing us today. He was seeing you right now. And I believe that's what the world needs today. The world needs the church. The world is waiting for the church, for the children of God to rise up to be manifested, to be full of the glory of God. People are hurting. People are going to hell. People are lost. People are lonely. People are sick. People are addicted. People are just so uh, confused right now. I mean, there's confusion everywhere. And what do they need? They need somebody with direction. They need somebody with stability. They need somebody with the love of God. They need somebody with the glory of God. That's you. That's us. And so I pray that this word will encourage you to leave this place and shine that light wherever you go and push that darkness out of the way. And remember, you are, you are on the offense, not on the defense. Don't be defensive for being a Christian. Don't make excuses for being a Christian. Take the offense. And let people see God's glory in your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, uh, I want to thank you for this time. I want to thank you for Pastor Craig and his family, for his wife, his children, for Kevin and his wife, for this awesome place. I thank you for every member of this church, for every person here. Your glory is here. Your presence is here. Lord God, let us realize what we have. Lord, I don't want to wait till I get to heaven to realize what I had in this life. I want to get it now so I can make a difference in this world. So I can help somebody who's lost find their way to you, Jesus. So I can bring healing to somebody who's hurting. and Restoration to somebody who is bound. Liberty to somebody who's in prison. I pray, Father God, that right now you touch people in this place. If there's anybody here, Lord, that, that is hurting, that is lost, that is bound, Jesus, come right now. Make yourself real to them. Set them free by your Spirit. Pour your Spirit into them and reflect that glory in their lives to this world. In Jesus' name, amen.